Okay, do you want to talk about the um, the bookstore today, Masculinity Bookstore? Yes. Okay, let's talk about these titles that center around masculinity as the major theme. And I'll start at the top of my bookstore, so this will be, I think, going backwards in time. So the first one I have here is Masculine Access. That was the first book we did together. Yeah. I, I quite liked that project. It was... Uh, an attempt largely to define heroism and kingship, I believe. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on that one. I thought that it was appropriate amount of time, and then I realized that I would never get anything done if I was going to spend, like, I don't know, I spent a long time. So anyway, I got faster at it. But actually, this isn't the most recent one, because then right below is Man Gearing, and I worked on that one, too. Yes, uh, man gearing I gave to my niece, Jamie, and it's more focused on uh, cultivating your own masculine aspects in our sissified, man-negating society that we're living in right now. Yeah, and next we have we have Taboo You, which I've also read. Taboo You was started as a Harm City book and was the first masculinity book. Because at that point, it became really apparent. I'm writing the Harm City stuff and reading Jack Donovan's Way of Men. And, you know, he's a neo-masculinist. So I realized that all these neo-masculinist guys, uh, even if they do a great work, they still look at tribalism and masculinity through the lens of the hierarchical civilization which is the sissy matrix to begin with civilization is the basis for sissy sissification and everything womanly comes out of it and slave culture comes out of it and um i mean civilization essentially is born with slavery and that means most men become slaves and essentially women and a few men get to maintain uh their hunter warrior status uh so uh I wanted to break away from the hierarchical model of masculinity and look at a true tribal model of it, which is uh, not like uh, an early civilization, a pyramid. OK, it's uh, it's a circle of overlapping spheres, including the feminine sphere and the spheres of the elderly and the children and the natural world and war and uh I used really Melville and Jack London to help me deal with uh, treading that thin line between the pyramid, corporate, postmodern, try to attempt to redo masculinity and what it was really like for our ancestors. And I think it was largely successful, but it was largely a counterpoint to Donovan's work. He was nice enough to review it, even though portions of it really bothered him. He suggested that he would write another book on masculinity in response to this. And I predicted where he was going to go. And I just went ahead of him and I data mined everything, dedicated the book to him, wrote it and published it in real time as Incubus of Your Sacred Emasculation, in which I take the hierarchical view of, of traditional masculinity and contrast it. And I basically contrast his view and my direct view in one book and try to take his side as much as possible i thought it worked very well and the ongoing project of that was twofold one was the book the end of masculine time or at the end of masculine time which focused a lot on the discrediting of uncles in our culture which i think is a very key key aspect of the modern uh feminization of society is to just turn uncles and particularly grandfathers out and away from the wives of boys. And the the other one is the third eye. And the third eye is really was going on at the same time that I was writing Incubus. And it was uh, focused on the metaphysics of masculinity, basically masculinity for nerds, the, 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 uh, the role of the perennial dissonant perspective, which is the perspective of the shaman. And I believe in in that book, at the same time, I was writing another masculinity book, which uh, was essentially just an essay called uh, The GQ Mugging Inquest, which I published under Black Studies. 
and, uh, and I think men's studies, which was essentially a study of a bunch of old black guys at a bar that had athletic backgrounds having debates that I formed as inquests because it always revolved around one guy being attacked by the other guys and having to put up his own legal defense, which was really a masculinity defense uh, for his actions or for his opinion. And uh, that ends up in, into the mountains of madness. Uh, but it also ends up published on its own. And uh, I wrapped Incubus at, at the end of Masculine Time and the third eye into one volume, which I titled under the God of things. And I added about, I don't know, 90 pages of essays, including some of my biggest essays, uh, on masculinity that had not been in a dedicated project. And I wrote some new ones for it. And it's one of my biggest books. Uh, I think it's sold very well. I would recommend that rather than buying them piecemeal. I would just buy that one. But, uh, if you have bought the other ones, there's still like almost 100 pages of unique material in there. Going forward from that, I wrote Honor Among Men, which is still on the editor's desk, which was a look at uh, negation of the man and the negation of the idea of honor, which is really an explicit part of that in our society. Uh, I also wrote Barbarism versus Civilization which is a dissonant view of masculinity and particularly the masculine ethos as a barbarian against the uh, feminine ethos of civilization, essentially Robert E. Howard's view against H.P. Lovecraft's view. And there's a real imbalance in the way we have dissonant thought today because most of the men that engage in this are more Lovecraftian because they're essentially sissies. They're nerds. They're the smartest among us. They're not the best men. They're the best thinkers. And to a certain degree, a lot of them are really feminized. And I generally read, I generally lose these guys as readers straight away. Uh, you know, after they get pissed off at the idea that uh, they need to man up to some degree. There's a couple other masculinity titles that are slipping my mind that, uh, that I think are in there. Okay. But those are the, those are the two unpublished ones that I can recall. Once again, you have, uh, your powers of memory and recall astonish me because you listed almost everything. So these, there's a few other titles that are maybe peripheral or a little bit lighter hearted. Well, here's of lions and men. Oh, I I missed that. That was huge. That's a big book. It's almost 500 pages. And it's based on a, I think it was a 27 page essay on masculinity in ancient Hellas. It's a really big book. I broke it into four parts. I think it failed to gel as a conceptual book and is really a couple of works combined together. Uh, the, the first section of it is some of the best stuff that I've ever written in a nonfiction. Uh, category. Um, uh, I believe that I, I got some heavy compliments uh, and, and it touches more on the, the military aspects of uh, of masculinity. What are the other ones that I missed? you got Happily Ever Under. I have. Oh, wow. OK. Happily Ever, Ever Under is a fictionalized history. I mean, it's real history. It all really happened. But I'm using two characters to keep getting reincarnated based on uh, two alcoholic crackheads that were getting in an argument at the Audi supermarket at Stemmer's Run on Old Eastern Avenue, I think back in 2015, uh, sometime like before the riots kicked off. I think I kind of wrote this concurrent with the Baltimore riots. And it's the history of the sexes through the eyes of Jack and Jill. So you have Jackal and Jill, the Neanderthals, and then I think uh, you have Jackham and Jilleth, you know, the, the biblical version Eventually, you end up with Red Jacket Shooting Bull and then, you know, his his Indian wife, some kind of Jill person. Uh, my favorite, I think, was Jack Dynamite and Jill Nequa, the modern African-American versions and uh, and so on. And it goes all the way to like the science fiction level where 50 years from now where, you know, you've uh, got another version of Jack and Jill. OK, in the post masculine uh, continuum. So it's actually history that's going to hold up 50 years from now. It's still predictive because uh, the last section of it, you know, is written from the point of view of a Russian 
uh, husband who has been purchased by a uh, beautiful blonde American woman uh, as her masculinity eye candy because she, she can't find anything but sissies, okay, Mexicans or Negroes in uh, the United States. So she's got to go to Manx for a wannabe MMA fighter uh, for her mail order husband. I really think that's that's probably the best humor. That's probably the best humor I've ever written. It, it's definitely up there with teaspoon slickens. All right. How about if I were king? Oh, if I were king, that's a, a series of uh, uh, answers I wrote to people that wanted me to run for president, and eventually asked me what I would do if I was king. And I just started going through every week what would happen. I think I'm in a sex scandal, you know not being able to keep my hands to myself in the secretarial pool or, 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 or something like that, you know, probably within in the third week. Uh, but I, I think I accurately tracked what my presidency would look like. And uh, I aborted it right at the point when the deep state would have killed me on the road. And then I came back with writing uh, what I would do if I was king, king in the world, because uh, some things were left unanswered and people were interested. It's a fun little book. It's set in Comic Sans. Bart Manny, very masculine guy, is on the cover. I mean, he sent me, there's only Taboo U shirts, two Taboo U shirts out there. Ishmael's, that's Bob's. And Bart Manny's and Bart Manny got a taboo use shirt and took a selfie in a men's room with like toilet paper hanging off a roll behind him. And when I got that, I was like, that's the cover. So the title is If I Were King. And then there's his picture and the subtitle is This Guy Would Take Care of the Details. OK, so, uh, so there you go. That's a, that's, that's a fun little book. But it's more in the, in the humor category. And it just shows you how masculine approaches to being a president would, would, would just result in total disaster and mayhem because it would just drive everybody crazy because the United States of America consists of, you know, a bunch of just faggots and sissies and batshit crazy feminists. So there you go. Uh, speaking, speaking of the last group there, you have two titles uh, about women, and I'm going to let you say the titles. Oh, yeah. Your Trojan Horse, spelled W-H-O-R-S-E, that started out as a project. I had these nerd writer, nerd readers writing in, well, I'm not getting any pussy. How do I get laid? You know, I mean, I want some action, you know. How come, you know, like, you know, like there's, you're broken down, fat, pot-bellied, you know, piece of shit uh, that doesn't make any money and you got five girlfriends. What's up with this? You know, I, I, I need some advice on how to deal with the ladies. And I'm working, I'm working on this outline. It's titled, Why You Don't Get Laid. Okay, so, and, and, and I, had a, I, I had a pretty extensive outline, like, because you're not Dope Dick Jones, for instance. I mean, that's a real good reason why you're not getting laid, because you're not that dude. Because you're not Dante Justine. You know, I mean, you if you don't walk into a bar and knock out 10 rednecks in 20 seconds, uh, how do you expect to get laid with, you know, some Angelina Jolie knockoff that's got tattoos from head to toe? You know, probably not going to happen. So uh, it finally occurs to me, I'm coaching dudes who half of them are in deep with bad women problems. Either they married some super hot looking woman who turns out to be a raging bitch on wheels, ripping their soul out and their balls off at the same time. Or they're getting too much action, and they can't focus on their fight game, and it's getting in the way of things. So I decided to rewrite it as, this was how you'd manage your stable of sex slaves, your female property, okay? And making allowance for the the woman that you might actually marry, which would should be a priestess. You know, so there, there's the whore, there's the manizer, there's the slave girl, and there's the priestess. There are no other types of women. OK, except for my sister, my mother and Lynn Lockhart. They have like their own separate categories. But every other woman on the planet is one of the above, usually with a subroutine fetish based on one of the other templates. OK, very simple to understand. And then I actually actually during the course of writing that book, I predicted the behavior of the editor who I was dating at the time. And I fell asleep after I predicted her behavior and wrote an article when she went home after editing one night. And when she came back and started re-editing, I woke up with her sitting on me, trying to strangle me, calling me a son of a bitch and a bastard because I had totally predicted her behavior because I'd given her some crappy food and she came over with a covered dish the next day. And I had predicted that. Okay, so 
there's proof of the pudding there that uh, your Trojan horse has even been edited by a woman who was dating me, even though she hated my guts. Okay, at the time. So there you go. It's, it's, it's proof of how you can manage your female property. Not necessarily forever. You know, there's everything's got shelf life. And then there's the sequel on bitches, which takes dealing with these alien creatures that we have to meet with to reproduce all the way to the point of dealing with male things that should be men, but aren't that behave like women and behave worse than women. Basically seven out of 10 of the guys you're ever going to run into are bitches. So in the end, your biggest problem is dealing with bitches. All the dudes that vote for butt chugger, Bernie Bros, the Gorgon Queen, okay, Frothy Latte, okay, any, you know, all the people that vote for faggot politicians, okay, that fantasize about dyke superheroes, all those guys, they're bitches, okay? This is another example how African-American thugs with, you know, 75 words in their vocabulary and almost no no skills in any in, in any area of functionality that you can think of, how they have a, a higher level of understanding of human interaction than the most brilliant guys in our society, okay? Because the tradition of just calling men bitches comes out of the African-American uh, feral population. All right? So, so there you go. One bitches. All right, we have three more titles that haven't been published, which are Why Grown Up Suck, Woke Devil, <laughs> and Why Grown Up Suck of Broken Men. Oh, The Silent of Broken Men, another masculinity book that's really current. A lot of Q and A's with guys that are trying to uh, meatheads are trying to think, or big brain nemesis that are trying to man up. And and this is the thing, the big challenge that we've got and you know what when i'm together with a bunch of meatheads you know i'm the nerd you know all these guys could kick the shit out of me you know if i'm with dudes that are like truly successful fighters and the guys that were war fighters and stuff like that and hunters you know i'm I'm the little twerpish nerd okay i might be a pain in the ass to fight i might be hard to kill uh, but i'm not the alpha male i'm kind of like the weird outsider so like I'm a historian in any boxing gym I'm at. You know, guys trying to make sure I don't get hurt because they consider me too delicate. So I'm in this middle ground. Hey, Darwin. I'm in this middle ground between those dudes and then the, brain, the big brain Nimbus guys. You know, the galactic brains, the super smart guys that want a man up, but society has incubated them against us. And they've their their families have worked against it. Everything has worked against it. These guys have actually been put under the gun. And the very big brain that they developed that helped them figure out a lot of lies that a lot of meatheads could never see has kind of prevented them from engaging, you know, really the liberating side of dissidents, which is just being a guy that does the most taboo thing that you could do in civilization, in the sissy matrix, which is fight. Particularly fight for the hell of it. Just fight because you want to fight, okay? In a ritual context, almost everybody on the planet hates that, except for the people that pay to see a dude lose. They don't pay to see a guy win. They pay to see a dude lose so they can make fun of him, okay? So th this is the challenge, and it's kind of the focus of that book and my later masculinity writing that's not that's all spread now in between uh, along with the harm city and the travel and everything, which is the idea of bringing the, the physical and the intellectual aspects of the masculine conditions together, because it is not just one or the other. Okay. It, just, it doesn't yeah. work if it's just one. People are really resistant to that idea and reading, you know, I, I'm just a, one more layer of connection where I can share your work with guys that probably need it. <laughs> I have nothing to say on it myself, you know, but what I have learned is that masculinity and even like this word patriarchy that people and 
in tone, like it means something. You know, it's it's really what men do together. It's not this mirror image of feminism, which is where a man wants a framework of a legal framework that, to control women. <laughs> you know, and I, I mean, I I sympathize with the uh, the fact that our society's been really damaged by divorce and single motherhood and stuff so I, I don't I don't support those things but when men start to like whine and boohoo about how we need this we need this patriarchy to control women I just think well I don't that's not even what I what it is to me it's it's what men do in their own sphere to develop themselves and create a, a, a social um, environment that is functional for everybody else. We're going to lose a combination, 10 YouTube subscribers yeah. <laughs> and, and Facebook likes right now, yeah. because I'm telling you, patriarchy is for bitches. Okay. I mean, that's I, what I, patriarchy the legal, is. yeah, it, it's like, it's like you're calling it comes daddy from government. Civilization. It's daddy okay. government to come and tell your women what to do. Okay. You, know? you got the, Who's the biggest sissy group out there? They got to strap on vests and get their women to commit suicides with bombs strapped to them. Okay. They're the Arabs. The Arabs are the biggest sissy fuck nuts out there. Okay. They need the whole village and the government to keep their women in line. Okay. Now, but where does that come from? That's the ancient cradle of these early civilizations. Iraq. Boom. Right there. So what is early civilization? It is the nomads coming in and conquering the cucked out goddess worshiping river civilizations and then taking every dude there, turning him into and the consolation prize he gets for being disarmed and emasculated is he now gets to be the head of the household, which is traditionally the woman's role. So the patriarchy in the medieval middle Eastern society has almost always produced substandard warrior cultures because the men are predominantly behaving like women in a merchant way and trying to micromanage things and always looking for leverage. They might do good politically. They might do good financially. Uh, they might have a lot of slave girls, okay, but a lot of their men aren't getting any pussy, okay? They're just not getting any action uh, because you're essentially the rich dudes are buying the broads, and they're very rarely any good in combat. How many of them do you see really essentially good in in MMA, in boxing, okay? They're always getting outclassed uh, by other cultures of people. So if you need a whole village of guys to keep your old lady in line while you're off kick, kicking the shit out of some other dude, no, I mean, that, that's just wrong. I mean, what you need is a little brother or a best friend or a father-in-law or a dad or a granddad that's going to protect your wife while you're away, okay? And so you go do your thing, and you come back, and she's glad to have you back. You know, th this got totally maimed by the feminism thing because it sent you both out of the house, and then you're coming back at the same time. All right, so, you know, yeah, that, that there's a direct act – there, there's a, a direct attack on masculinity implicit in patriarchy. I'll, I'll have fun with the patriarchy thing, okay? Uh, you know, it, it's uh, – but it comes from slavery. Patriarchy is not based on anything else. All the patriarchs of the Bible owned numerous men who were not allowed to bear arms. They owned children. They owned women. They owned slave girls. They had the authority – that the king was going to send some killers out to keep anybody in line. That dude didn't have the authority to beat up all those, the masculine authority to beat up all those servants. They're afraid of the king with his band of thugs. Okay. It was like a moral feudalism. Okay. Uh, conjoined with these slave economics. And it's, I, I cover that in Happily Ever Under. That's in the biblical, I do two biblical chapters on it. It basically demonstrates how this works. I think it's covered in, in masculine access as well because uh, we talked about how within African cultures there's more of what we perceive as matriarchy where women women own property and women – because women do kind of like a, a type of agriculture, which isn't like what farming we do. But anyway, it's kind of a gardening – 
Um, the point is that their social uh, structure is what we would call matriarchal, but it isn't really in contrast to patriarchy. Like in European cultures and families, uh, paternity is very important. You know, your kids are your kids and uh, your wife's not supposed to be having other people's kids where that isn't super important in African cultures. It's huge generalization, okay? Um, but anyway, that's covered in masculine access. I mean, the, the truth is that you, there are two different spheres and they overlap, the men's sphere and the women's sphere. And it's not, rejecting patriarchy is not saying that the single motherhood married to the government is a good alternative. <laughs> it's not a good, you know, it's not a good alternative. Well, patriarchy is what we have now with the narco tyranny. You've got women married to the government voting for the government against their men. That's patriarchy. That's pure patriarchy. You just take the men on the ground out of it. That's what patriarchy does. You, you go back and read the book of Job. Almost every dude in that's a slave. Okay. Job is some kind of petty uh, king or clan leader or tribe leader or something like that. And most of the men under him are slaves, including his sons. Okay. And that's what patriarchy does. It makes most men slaves. You know, and eventually, once you put democracy in, then the women get direct connection with the power structure. Instead of the patriarchs having that direct connection, it accretes up to a single patriarchy grouped together on the top instead of a local patriarchy. And I think it fosters a lot of hostility between men and women where you see these really hostile guys on the right wing that uh, believe, well, first they believe that when all women are, they have these weird ideas about women. <laughs> you know, it's not like women are innocent angels, but they have these ideas that just are not also not reality about how wicked women are and how their our instincts are destructive. And, you know, I mean, you might say that too because of this democracy thing, but it's because women's instincts are relative to a different sphere. And so, yeah, you take these protective instincts and these socialistic instincts, which make sense in a family setting, and they don't make sense on larger scales. But I just see this hostility on the part of the men. I think it's this feeling that, that sometime in the past there was some kind of idyllic situation where women obeyed their men and where every man got a, a girlfriend, like, when he turned 18 or something, you know, he got issued a lifetime intimate partner and he didn't have to worry about that anymore and that now that all the risk of marriage is on men and I just think there's ri there's always been risk in marriage and there's inherent risk for women so I, I would like to see your uh, model of masculinity make some way in inroads there so but well it's an example of how patriarchy causes emasculation because most of the guys don't get laid or they've all got to go after the same whore OK, which might have been a, a dancer way back in the day. Now, who, who knows? Maybe it's some kind of like virtual online girlfriend or something. Who knows? Uh, the generally guys that are currently banging broads, OK, are not demonstrating a bunch of animosity towards women. The guys that demonstrate animosity towards women generally aren't getting laid. They have fallen for the whole goddess construct of civilization. And at some point, they let the fact that they had a mother and not a daddy and a teacher in school that was a female or a faggot get them into a state of worship of the feminine as like this high ideal. And the masculine stuff, like killing people and beating people up, uh, that's all bad. Okay, and it's not good. And masculine yin and yang, the, 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 the yang, you know, the masculine is dark and the masculine is violent and, and, and the woman is all good. And then they end up putting this normal woman on a pedestal and then she fails to live up to their, their expectations. Now, look, the uh, one thing that guys that aren't getting laid and haven't had a lot of experience with women do not understand is that women are a lot more loyal than men. And now when racially oriented men look at the fact that women always sell their own men, black women have sold all their own men down the road into prison and put them on the government farm for money. White women have sold their men down the political road to the uh, taking their wages away, cut their wages in half, have are totally 
sidewinding them through politicians, through elite politicians and money grubbers. This is this is loyalty. This is an expression of loyalty. Women are loyal to the patriarchy. All right. So now the patriarchy only consists of the super elite white men. That's it. That's all the patriarchy is. Super elite white men. You got the dissonant super elite white dude Trump out there. Most of the super super elite white dudes hate the regular white dudes. Okay, scared to death of the black dudes, and they use the women, the direct appeal of the women through the democracy engine and the woman's natural high level of loyalty to the patriarchy to screw almost all the dudes out there. Okay, that's how it works. And if we lose a whole bunch, I, I hope we lose like 100 YouTube subscribers and like 10 Facebook likes on that. I really know that we did a good job of sorting terminal sissies out of this batch right here. OK, so thanks a lot for taking me down this road, dear. I'm uh, I'm currently unraveling. Did 7000 words of Night Song or the Nords today. Actually had a the most misogynistic battle scene I've ever written. OK, just like. Oh, yeah. Brutality and misogyny. Boom. You know, like on the battlefield, it was uh, it, it was pretty good. So uh, uh, that masculinity ended up being the right path to go down here. I think so, too. You seem to be um, well, more cheerful now that now that we've discussed all those things. Um, I don't know if we said much about wh why grown ups suck and woke devil. Oh, OK. Dude, thank you. Woke Parenting Handbook. It's basically guerrilla warfare for children to wake them up right before the teenage zombie apocalypse when basically children become like these insane minor league adults. OK, and then and then that's it. You know, it's pretty much a done deal. So it's a way to try to salvage the honesty of the childhood mind by uh, writing a book that will hopefully get snuck in by some grandparents into the hands of their children and give them some clues on how to avoid brainwashing by their parents because their parents have been brainwashed and the parents lie to you. A grown up society is based on theft. All right. You know, parents are there's good parents out there, but most grown ups suck. And at this point, you think about it, most grown ups aren't your parents. And they're out there to screw you over if you're a kid. OK, so if you're lucky enough to get a good parent that might give you a book like this, uh, then, you know, I think it would give you a big edge up. It started with a friend of mine that was a school teacher that wanted me to become a school teacher and teach children. And I came up with my first day's curriculum knowing that I would get taken out in handcuffs at the end of the first day or at the beginning of the second day, probably the beginning of the second day after these kids went home and told their parents what I was teaching them. So I, I we talked a little bit about this with Sean and his family. The point is that um, some parents, especially Sean and his family, for example, are really, really good parents. And um, there's sure. this, this boomer aspect of like that, you can't trust anyone over 30 or, you know, that it's like that from the song. I think they, they fuck you up, your mom and dad. Um, I would say with great confidence that you would be welcome among the homeschooling families that I know that we're just always looking for interesting and fun things to do with our kids and imparting, especially in the group that I'm in, we really value a classical approach. So when you're talking about public school, which could be either a prison-like setting or in our area, we also have these really incredibly competitive and um, high-stress settings for kids. And, you know, either of those, I think, you would not not do well in. Well, those are the grown-ups that suck the most. Yeah. This isn't parent, why parents suck. This is why grown-ups suck. And if you have good parents, your biggest enemies and their biggest enemies are the school teachers. I mean, school teachers should pretty much just all be taken out and sold into slavery, okay, working as strippers or janitors or, you know, librarians or whatever, okay, unpaid to put up for the sins of, you know, brainwashing children and attacking families. You know, so uh, th that's that's the idea of it. And, for instance, me, my parents lied to me about everything. They didn't know it was lies. They were repeating the lies that their parents told them, okay? And then 
and then so on down the line. And nobody has lied to their children more than the boomers. And see, the boomers know. The boomers are the biggest liars out there. They know. That's that whole drug-addicted generation. Okay? So it's just most people. It's a, it, civilization makes a parent a slave. Just having a child makes you a slave and puts you under the gun. Just like the man under civilization becomes a slave. Okay? Like the origin of the word husband. Okay? Uh, puts him under the gun. And, and his wife and his children are hostages that the government can hold against him. All right, so most grown-ups are forced to suck by the matrix of civilization. And this is why we still got a third of our parents still beat their children, although tribal societies, except for the aborigines, just never did that. You know, I mean, because it, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> so. Well, there's there's this also this thing where, like, as a parent, whether it's modern age or what, you there's certain things you have to make your kids do. Can you stop that noise, please? Like, be quiet sometimes and um, brush their teeth and go to bed on time and wake up on time. And this is like, this isn't going anywhere. You know, even as a homeschooling mom, I need to brush my kids' teeth. And I have two children and one of them... I had to um, wrestle to the floor every day of her life, wrestled her down to the bath, bath rug, and while she was screaming, provided an open mouth so that I could brush her teeth. And she can remember this. And honestly, I, you know, I think in order to equal that level of trauma, it would take a lot of spankings. But that was just what we had to do to brush your teeth, honey. <laughs> well, the point is, is go ahead. The government coercion, the fact that every parent is threatened by force, okay, as part of the subtext of his or her life every day, okay, is going to result in high levels of force being being used against children in comparison to the same racial groups in pre-civilized societies. Okay, that's that's just what happens. It's baked into the cake because it's a buildup of tension. It's a, when you have people living under threat physically in charge of other people, eh, you know, there's going to be more force used than is used when you're not living under threat, particularly when the threat is implicit and it's not obvious all the time, but you can never get away from it. If you break a traffic law anywhere in this country, you can be pulled out of your car and beat up by some law officer anywhere you go. And everybody knows that, even though they might say it's not so. Okay. And that's in there. All right. And you don't have a history of children being ritually beaten like Melville's stepmother beating him every day with a weapon. Until you have a slave society where the slaves are regularly beaten by their master, because slaves are generally governed by the same rules that govern children. That's why they tend to be pretty well treated in aboriginal and barbarian societies at least low barbarian societies, because they're treated like children and eventually sold out or adopted in. So the other one is woke devil, which is masculinity in the context of race, particularly what is apparently the only racial continuum that's permitted, which is like ebony and ivory. I mean, that's like the that's like it's our society is so sick that there's like only one dualistic racial dynamic. And like most of the people in the world who are Asians and mestizos don't even exist. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. It's totally insane. Uh, but it's about kind of how I've used that generally relationships with African-American men, largely building alliances with them to overcome feral African-American men on one hand and the sissy merchant mentality white man on the other hand. And the cops, who are their own race, they're blue. That's what that's about. Some fun back and forth with, you know, different woke ebony devils, including some apprentice ebony devils. You know, that's the thing about woke deviltry is you can, I was originally titling it Magic Negroes and White Devils. Okay, but but that would get me in too much trouble. So it's now woke devil because basically how... Woke devils of the ebony and ivory variety can work together to undermine the whole sissy system. This brings me to another point, which is that if you have strong 
masculinity, then gender relations are better. It's also true with race relations because you have all sorts of friendships and working relationships and other situations where uh, a masculine man can either manage the sissies or work on the same level with another masculine man. Whereas a lot of these sissies on the right wing are like, they want Sharia on white women and they want some kind of government enforced ethnic cleansing or something, you know? So to me, it's very similar. Like you still need daddy to come and help you for whatever's your problem, yeah. you know? Yeah. I would suggest to uh, any of the young men that are, that are upset with my idea that, you have to cultivate your woman's loyalty. It's very easy to get a woman loyalty loyal to you. It's easier than with a guy. Okay. If you can't do it, send her to me. Okay. All right. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make it so. If you can't manage a woman, okay, then it, you should be like a, a bandit or a pirate, a serial killer or, or, or something. You should be some whack job out there just hunting people if you can't manage a woman. Because if you've got any human empathy, you should be able to manage. Okay.